Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Greco. I'm head of security solution sales for ServiceNow. And on behalf of ServiceNow and Accenture, we'd like to welcome you this morning to this presentation on Zero Trust. Uh, just a quick overview on the agenda today. Uh, we're going to start shortly uh, with a keynote speech on Zero Trust. At, at 9.30, we're going to have a fireside chat um, with some uh, ServiceNow security leaders and Accenture. We're going to follow that at uh, 10.15 with a panel discussion. Um, so hopefully this will be a very exciting agenda for everyone. Um, just as a note, later today, we're also going to be running a security challenge for a number of our customers and um, prospects within the federal agency. And we've gamified our security products um, for competition and education. And so that's just another aspect of our, our service and offerings uh, by ServiceNow. Um, before I introduce our our keynote speaker, just a couple of, couple of items, you know, feel free to uh, take advantage of uh, the food and coffee outside. Just ask that uh, everyone turn their mobile phones off to, or mobile phones to silent, just so we don't have any uh, disturbance. I know many of you probably have already done that already, um, but just a reminder. Um, again, I'd like to say thank you to Accenture for participating with us in this event. Um, as I was preparing to introduce our keynote speaker and, and learning about his background, uh, I was reminded of something from my past. And uh, I was working for a company. Uh, it was a division of uh, British Telecom. And, and British Telecom decided uh, that they wanted this company to be very different, very different from the other parts of, of British Telecom. And so what they did was they located this company in the US and they created a very different structure outside of British Telecom, a different culture. And one day the CEO was being interviewed and they said, his name was Jerry Thames. And they said, Jerry, you know, this is a very interesting prospect, what you're doing here with this company and this culture. And he said, you know, how do you how do you find people? What do you look for in people when you're forming this culture that you want to be very different from anything else? And Jerry said, I look for scar tissue. I look for scar tissue. He said, people with scar tissue have lived and breathed, have learned, have failed. And it's that scar tissue that's going to make us successful. And when I was speaking to our keynote speaker and, and learning about his background, um, that came up to mind because I think he's got a tremendous amount of scar tissue that makes him such a valuable resource and perspective within the security environment. Uh, a little bit more about our speaker. Um, he is the chief information officer and the assistant inspector general of information for the Department of Health and Human Services. He has more than 24 years of IT experience, starting and, and probably forming the foundation for a lot of what he does. Uh, he started in the Army. I think what makes our keynote speaker um, particularly relevant for this is he's got experience in zero trust, not as someone who's had to implement zero trust as a mandate or a directive, but someone who's been an evangelist for Zero Trust from the very start. He is co-chair of the CIO's in in Innovation Council for Zero Trust, as well as a co-chair for the ATAR or Zero Trust Working Group. So this is a um, you know, very exciting uh, person with a great perspective. And with that, please join me in welcoming Jerry Karen. Good morning. This is not product placement. It's just, I'm not a coffee drinker and I drink soda first thing in the morning. So thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I'm pleased to be here. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit through what our journey looks like at HHSOIG, probably talk about some of the stuff that we're doing in some of the working groups as well. Um, I know the um, 
working group at the federal level that I co-chair with uh, Sylvia Burns from FDIC and Al Pierre Kerman uh, from the NCCOE. We're looking to have a summit coming up, um, be a, probably a day or two of government only, and then um, a reverse day, industry day where we'll be having some vendors as well and some practitioners to get some feedback on what uh, the industry is seeing and things like that. So a lot of, lot of things going on, a lot of good groups out there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that hopefully too. So this is, this is my attempt probably about seven years ago at this point of putting zero trust on one page because it was frustrating. I, um, before I left my last job, I was the eviction and remediation person for the department because I was in operations. I, I have not come up through the cybersecurity ranks, but I come up through operations. The result of, or the advantage I had from where I was, I was basically the infrastructure person, running network, active directory, all those things at the, at the enterprise level. So somebody was doing IT in the organization, they leveraged my infrastructure. So I kind of knew what was going on. And you know, you, you learn a lot of things if, if you're observant and everything. So after being through some events and going to something like RSA and hearing the John Kindervad and things like that, um, when that started and started talking about it many years ago, that it started making sense to me. So I like to say I was cool before the Everybody else got cool talking about zero trust and really understanding it. So put it on one page. Now, do I expect you to read this? No, but try to make sense of it so we could put it and I have it on a plotter size paper so I can put it on the table in, in the executive conference room and say, this is what we got to be doing. This is all of it. The thing about zero trust is it's not a tool. It's not one product. It's not one solution. It's an architecture and everything on here has to work together. And it all revolves around that center, which is basically at the end of the day, we're trying to protect data. Now, I've had arguments about that identity, I'm trying to protect identities, but it's right data to the right people at the right time. If you got compromised and I'm the cybersecurity analyst, probably my first two questions are you are gonna be, what did you have access to? And is there exfil? What am I asking about at that point? I'm asking about data, right? That's what I'm trying to protect. Now, identity is very important. We do have to protect identity because it's the right data, the right people at the right time. Very judicious, but try to, at the end of the day, we're trying, talking about protecting data. So I am also forced to certified. I always go back and, you know, there's, you know, DOD just released their strategy. There's eight. 800-207 out there and everything, but go back to the principles. No matter what you do, you go back to the principles. And these pretty much align with force, just principles. Trust no one, especially if you're an X-Files fan, you know about that. You trust no one. Know your people and your devices. So what do I have control of? What's within my realm of control? Validate identity at every step. Design system, assuming they're compromised, so assume breach. Just trust everything. So when a breach happens, you're as protected as can be stopping lateral movement, things like that. Use dynamic access controls. Access to services must be authenticated, authorized, encrypted at all times and can be revoked during a session. So make decisions. It's not one time through the door. You are dynamically checking all the factors all the time. And if it reaches certain thresholds, you take an action. It's not, come on in, have a nice day, happy you're here. You're always checking all kinds of factors. constantly. So you constantly evaluate that risk. And then you do the right size protections over the things that mean the most. I like to use the analogy, and it's probably a terrible analogy, the crown jewels. If you lost the crown jewels, that's it, right? But if I lost my bologna sandwich, there's plenty of bologna and bread in the world. I'll make another one. Am I concerned? Yeah, because now I'm, I'm a little frustrated. But can I answer the question, are my crown jewels still protected? My sandwich got compromised, but my crown jewels are still protected. If I can answer that question, that's good. I've stopped lateral movement. I like to use this analogy because, and it helps um, set the stage with executives because they kind of get that. There's been football analogies, um, baseball analogies. I like to use the movie theater. I go to the multiplex movie theater and I enter the lobby. I have a ticket, I enter the lobby. They where do they check my ticket? They check it when I enter the lobby door. 
now I have access to the concessions. I have access to the restrooms, all those things that you would expect to have because I'm allowed in the movie theater. But the movie theater I go to usually, or one of them, I can go into any movie because why? There's no ticket takers at the door. There's nobody checking my ticket again at that door. I can go into every. So movie being the data, I can move laterally all day. I can go in one movie, hop out, go into another movie. So I'm moving laterally throughout the movie theater. That's kind of the way we're doing it now. Or, or we've done it. I call it the Tootsie Roll Pop. Some people call it the Castle Mo. Hard outer shell, soft gooey center. Right? So we got to get away from that castle and moat. So what do we want to do is we want to check, am I allowed in the movie theater? Check, check my ticket. But I'm putting ticket takers at all the theater doors now. Am I allowed in that movie? Some of them now, you have reserved seats. Now, I, I reserve a seat in some of the movies, but there's nobody that ever comes to check to say, are you in the right seat, sir? We have to do that with zero trust. But that's kind of like talking around the authentication and the identity part, right? But what are the other factors in that movie? Is the, is the movie showing on the screen? Are the lights low? Are the exit signs lit? Are the lights that on the floor lit? Are people in their right seats? There's many factors that we have to understand and check constantly. So that usher has to come in constantly and check those factors to make sure that everything's okay. Because if one of those factors goes wrong, what has to happen? Threshold is met, action needs to be taken. Again, the core principles all revolve around data. At the end of the day, that's what I'm worried about protecting. Now, yes, if you read the 800-207 or the DHS materials, they have seven pillars or, or five pillars, which are data, applications, network, endpoints, and identity. If you read the DOD document, which I've been leveraging uh, some of that documentation for, for a long time now, is they have seven. I, I actually have an, had added an eighth pillar as well. So there's orchestration and automation and there's data and analytics. And then I also say governance because governance runs throughout and that's the non-technical aspect of this. That is your risk thresholds. That is your policies. That is your tolerance. That's all that non-technical stuff that has to govern through all those pillars because all those pillars have to work together at the end of the day. Can't just do like some people's like, we're doing the identity pillar. And they can do a great job at the identity pillar. But I always warn, understand the dependencies between your pillars, because why? What happens if you have to do something? You got to re-engineer. Nobody, especially the financial folks, don't like re-engineering because it costs you more money and more time. So we'll talk about a little bit about what we did. So step one, uh, so we identified the sensitive data. So we're taking the data inventory understand where your data is and not just where your data is, where's your data flowing. So one of the projects that um, I'll mention again later is we're mapping our data flow. So we're gonna take an application, has a lot of hooks into a lot of things and we're gonna map that data flow. I gotta understand what my data is doing if I'm gonna protect it because what does normal look like? Because when abnormal happens, I gotta do something. So, Map the accessible route, the acceptable routes, make sure that's right, right? So we have to work with the system owners or the data owners and, and the choice transaction flows. Then architect, architect our zero trust micro perimeters. So that data, I don't, we have data warehouses, we have data lakes. Now we have the boat, the, the boat houses or what, whatever they're called now, where those two come together. Um, so we want to put perimeters around different parts of data. Because why is that crown jewels and bologna sandwich? If I put them in the same database, the crown jewels, the bologna sandwich gets compromised, crown jewels go too. Now I want to do micro segmentation around my data. So I want to segregate those things. I want to monitor. Monitoring is very important. I talked about all the factors, taking in all the factors, all the telemetry I can get to feed that dynamic risk score so I can make decisions and, and understand what data I can leverage to make decisions off. So one of the things um, talked with um, one of the consulting companies talked about cyber mesh. So he kind of talks about after zero trust, 
you do all the technical things, there's what's called the cyber mesh. And that cyber mesh is basically taking telemetry from many different tools that you have available, adds up to some kind of score. And then is that, what is that, what is that score? And based off what my thresholds are, all right, this factor, this factor, this factor adds up to this. Okay. Um, you may log on with a PIV card, fully managed machine that I'm managing. I have good telemetry on that coming from a network that I know. You're a government employee. And so I have some good assurances around some of those things. So the risk is, and you're trying to access this, depending on what that target is that you're trying to access. Okay. I'll let you access that. But in the realm of things, sometimes some tools are slower than others. Now I'm checking that computer. You're missing some patches. My risk threshold might change as a result while you're working. And I may have to downgrade you to read only or kick you off depending on how critical things are. Or conditional access policies get tripped. So leveraging the cloud as a factor as well and the things that it provides as well is very big in this. A lot of people say, well, what about the cloud? Cloud has great tools. Leverage them. Understand how to monitor them. Because even though it's FedRAMP, you got to understand how to monitor the cloud because why? It's still your data. So understand the things that it makes available and how to monitor it. Embrace security and automation. It's got to be automated. How many times have we heard about events and usually what happens is something looks odd or a customer reports something odd. And we, you know, when a customer reports something odd, we're not monitoring something somewhere probably, right? But red blinky light goes off. What usually happens? Hey, you see this? What do you think that means? What should we do? Now that sets off. Now, now we start talking about it and we start thinking about it and everything. What's happening? If it is malicious, time, right? It it's taking time. And everybody's seen the stats on, you know, from the time and a malicious act actually happens till it's discovered and then action is taken and everything. It's days. Um, and they're gaining a foothold, they're moving laterally and things like that. Um, so automation and making decisions as real time as possible is very important in the zero trust. If you have seen the DOD strategy that came out, um, I've, we've been using this for a while, but you'll see something like it. I, I've added a couple things actually um, under a couple, but these are the pillars. Of course, it aligns with the DHS um, pillars. You have data, you have endpoints, you have network, you have applications, you have users. But then there's visibility analytics. I need that to make decisions. That's the telemetry, all of those things that I need. And then the automation and orchestration, which I just talked about. And of course, across your policies, your thresholds, your risk tolerances, governance, it runs through the whole thing. Now, this is how we use this. So my over a year ago, when I first came to HHS OIG, I introduced zero trust. I had to train my staff on zero trust. They were not thinking about it. They were not hearing about it. And this is before the executive order came out the year. That, that year. So I had this, I said, if I did not spend another dime, what can I do? And how am I, how are we doing at it? So we took the DHS maturity model after we inventory tools that I could take advantage of these functions. Are we doing it? Are we not doing it? If we are doing it, how good are we doing it based off the, the, the concept of that, the maturity model and we rated ourselves. Now, if I wasn't doing it, did I have a tool that could I could leverage to do it? Because why now I'm knowing what am I, my gaps are? What, am I, what do I need to work on? So now I got a good picture. And as you'll see here in a second, it's something I can show executives. That's kind of easy to understand because we use simply red, yellow, green, right? Green, we're doing good. Red, we're either doing bad or we're not doing it at all. And yellow, we got some work to do. So um, if you're a vendor and you've talked to me, or if you have been in our ATARC working group, this is your homework. You want to talk to me about zero trust, which everybody wants to do, it seems, all the time? I need to know what functions you cover. 
and if that's a function that I need. So this is their homework. But I also ask them, not only what are your primary functions, but where do you integrate? Because why? This is an integration exercise. This is an architecture. So integration can be one of two things. It can be we integrate and provide you telemetry so you can calculate your risk score through APIs. Or if you want to use our tool, you need some kind of authentication of something. So we need to uh, integrate with your authenticator of some sort so you can access our tools. So two kinds of integration. But what do you do primarily and where do you integrate? So the result of our inventory, and this is just an example, this is not the way we look. Ours is probably more red, but uh, um, actually, but this is what it ends up looking like. Green, we got it, check. Yellow, needs some work, we can improve. We're not at the maturity level we wanna be. Red, we're not doing it, or we got a lot of work to do. Now I know my gaps. So now I know kind of what my as is was. So moving towards zero trust, talked about, you know, the Tootsie Roll Pop security, hard outer shell, soft GUI center. Then we move to macro segmentation. Macro is network, you know, VLANs, things like that. Micro is getting down around the data aspects and then moving to zero trust. So now everything has its own little perimeter around it. We just don't have that one big perimeter, that castle and moat concept. One of the things that I did this past year, and I think it's very important, and everybody goes in and they think, say zero trust, it's, a, it's the IT pro shops problem. And so we do it in that silo, not us. We have educated our users on zero trust. Why are we doing that? Because eventually things are gonna change for them, how they work. So I look at zero trust as being an, an opportunity to modernize as well. Why? We're looking at SASE. What's great about that? I don't like VPNs. They're a secure way to deliver a malicious payload is, is how it was described to me and I agree. Now there's technologies rather than hairpinning them back to one of my on-premises data centers and just to send them back out to ServiceNow or some other cloud or the internet, how inefficient is that? So send them more direct, boom, great performance. Did it in an overseas location once, 80% performance in some of the sites that they were going to. I'm still getting my security telemetry and meet my tick requirements because it's still secure too in different ways. But I'm providing them a benefit. But I'm also asking a couple questions as we go through this journey. Not how do you work? How do you want to work? So we can build those requirements in and how they want to work in the future. Do they want to be more mobile? Do they want to be able to do everything from their phone, from their personal phone, from their um, GFE device? Also, what's the data they need and when do they need that? Now I'm helping with my inventory of that data, the thing I'm trying to protect. So now I'm building those personas, which are very important. And how's this gonna help? It's gonna make it much less frictionless when I start making changes eventually to how they work, because why we're including their requirements and we're taking them under consideration. So we're modernizing. It's not, we're not just layering on security. So a lot of benefits. So our zero trust roadmap, um, I showed you kind of like what our, gaps are what our as is um so we have the five pillar we five pillars to keep it aligned with dhs and i have basically five uh six um foundational projects that i identified initially one is a sock i'm small i have a person that watches tools but i want a 24 7 sock so as a service is great doj provides sock as a service and tools to help um, they have endpoint tools, they have SASE tools, they have some other tools, great help. So definitely look at uh, as a service options, shared services um, is a great advantage because now somebody else is managing that and I don't have to worry about that. Mapping data. So we're doing a proof of concept, we're mapping data. We gotta understand how our data flows, where it is, where it resides and who's accessing it and make sure and so that we can understand what it is we're trying to protect. Maturing our identity management. We have some 
manual things that are going on. I want to automate that as much as possible. We have digital identities. Of course, you create a new application. What happens? You proliferate a new digital identity, probably. So we want to rein that back in and herd those cats in. Secure web access, we talked about that, using SASE, going more direct to your destination, still getting that security telemetry, but sending our users more direct to where they need to be. Doing asset discovery, creating that CMDB. What do I own? What do I control? What is, what is in my realm of, that I can change and monitor? And then um, data integration, doing a risk operational risk dashboard. It'll probably be more static than what I've talked about, being more dynamic. But I got to start taking the tools that I have advantage of and start integrating them, making those relationships, normalizing that data, understanding what I have access to and understand what my gaps are. So I'm starting to do that integration. We're going to start small with things that we know, objects that we know, like a bunch of a group of laptops. What is all the information I can understand about those laptops? What, who are the users of those laptops? What is the software on those laptops? What is the hardware? And then move out from there and build off that. So our roadmap, we have some gaps. So we have uh, for each of the pillars, uh, we have our roadmap for the next few years as a result of doing the work that we've done. We understand our gaps, our, our current state. We have identified our FY23 projects. In addition to those projects that I just showed, um, those foundational projects, and we know what we got to do in 24 as well. We're in two year planning cycles. But this work is allow us to tell us what we're doing. And, and we have some things probably goes beyond FY24. It's because it's a big undertaking. It's a lot of work. Um, we have a lot of prerequisite things that we need to do. So there's a lot of work ahead. Um, but when I introduced Zero Trust to my staff, they started looking at it. And it's like, man, we've been doing it this way. This actually takes care of a lot of our problems if we do these kind of things. So introducing them to the art of the possible, new ways to do things. Um, it's a different way of thinking, still wrapping their heads around, but some of them have just grasped onto it and they see advantages for them as well uh, going forward. Other thing I would caution of is don't make it overly complicated. So why I say that is, you know, we have this. Now I can probably go out and buy, there's a best of breed tool out there for every one of these functions. Now, if I did that, I'd have the best tool to do every one of these functions. Can I sustain that? No, that's over, gonna be overly complex. I'm not gonna be able to sustain it. So keep it as simple as possible for sure. Now that's my pitch. Hopefully that sets off the rest of the day well on the subject. Um, I'm always available. Like I said, we have the ATARC working group. We have about 70 vendors in that working group. Uh, we had phase one where we basically allowed each vendor 75 minutes to do their pitch. They did their homework, showed us what they're going to do. We gave them use cases. Now, phase two, which is going to be really great, is we're saying team up, integrate, show us. Here are uh, 15 use cases. They're going to run through those 15 use cases. We're going to have a pre uh, screening board to make sure that, you know, they aren't taking too many liberties. They have an outline. This is what we want in your presentation. It will be for government only. And they will show us an integrated active lab and actually show us that they do it, not just tell us through slides and things like that. So we're looking forward to that. We expect to have a bunch of labs um, setting up for that after the first of the year. Um, the NCCOE, of course, is doing their project as well with certain vendors. Um, but we're pretty open to a large number of vendors. Um, we're not selecting, um, but we're just telling them now you got to team up. So some of them are bringing in their integrator partners, things like that. We may see the same, same solution in five different labs, which is perfectly fine. Um, but now we get to see how it works with other solutions and things like that. So we're, we're very excited about moving to this phase two. Uh, it's a heavy lift, a lot of uh, logistics to it, getting people on the same page. Um, we got the pre the pre screening board ready to go um, as soon as the first ones come through, and then you know if there are some deficiencies, we'll tell them. Um, you know you really didn't demonstrate that right, or you don't have your prerequisite homework done. You didn't have this in your presentation. We'll kick them back, uh, get a chance for them to revise, uh, make sure that we, we want apples to apples when they display these things to the government. So we're looking forward to that. Um, you can contact me at any time. 
Um, I'm always happy to talk about this. I could go on all morning um, and take up the rest of your day, but I do have another one I have to go talk to. Um, but please reach out at any time and um, if you have any questions at all. And I think that's all. I, yeah. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I, ask if, I, don't, I don't know if you have time for one question. If somebody has one question, if they want to raise their hand, I'll pass the mic. No? Oh, here we go. No? Nope. Was that a no <laughs> Jerry, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. We're going to move to the uh, to the next uh, phase of our uh, morning here with the fireside chat. I'd like to in invite Mike and uh, and Dean up. Sorry, Nicole. I'll, I'll I'll let you guys introduce yourselves to the to the team here. All right, is this on? It is. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Mike Rohde. I'm our deputy CISO at ServiceNow, focused on our US federal government environments with uh, the task of implementing things like zero trust in in the environment, as well as ensuring our FedRAMP compliance to, uh, to meet the US federal government standards. And I'm joined here today by Nicole Dean. Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Nicole Dean. Um, I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Accenture Federal Services. Great. And we'll get started here with a little fireside chat here today. Um, you know, first question, I think Jerry did a really good job of talking about the concepts and principles of zero trust and what's going on uh, within HHS. When I say zero trust to you, Nicole, what does what does that mean to you, and what does that mean to you, uh, as from an enterprise perspective within AFS? Sure. So let's let's start with how we even get to zero trust. Zero trust has been around the the terminology and the concept for quite a long time, but it's only as of late that it's really gained traction and everybody is talking about it. Um, and it can mean 10 different things to 10 different people on what zero trust is. But how did we actually get here and why is everybody focused on it now? So if, if we go back, you know, um, our guest, our keynote speaker used the castle and moat, and that's what I did. I mean, for years, that was how we did security. Everything was inside the castle. We had this moat, um, you know, filled with sharks and crocodiles. And, uh, you know, we had the fortress wall and we kept building it up and we kept putting more things. And we might have a few secret tunnels out of the castle. Those would be your VPNs. Um, but then what happened? Cloud happened. Mobile happened. COVID, everybody went home, happened. And all of a sudden, the wall fell down, the moat dried up, and the castle crumbled and turned more into like an amorphous blob. Um, so that perimeter that we had for the longest time that we all focused on building up to protect our environment kind of went away. And so the concept was, well, now, now that we don't have that, what do we need to do? So this zero trust term really took a foothold. And I think our keynote speaker really hit on it. It's, it's really about constant verification and validation continually over and over, whether that's from the identity, whether that's from the device. Um, and it's trying to find those principles so that you can really have a workforce um, that can be anywhere, anytime, and have access to the right information. And you know it's them, you know it's the right device, um, and you know that's the data that they're supposed to be able to access. And that's where zero trust has really gained traction in the last years is because that whole methodology that we used before to build up that strong perimeter has just crumbled. And we we all live in a new environment now. Um, and that's where zero trust has become important to everybody from an enterprise perspective. So. I'm going to ask you a question now, Mike. So what challenges do you see um, as a federal industry partner in implementing and supporting a zero trust environment? Yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with the, the old mindset of setting up the moat and, and having the perimeter controls. Really, the challenge now is, 
is okay we've got to change the way of thinking we've got to change the way that we've done business for the last 15 20 plus years and really trying to communicate what does it actually mean to to implement the zero trust model and you know i think the the guidance that's out there is hopeful but it's still very conceptual and when you start looking at okay how am i going to get to this this zero trust compliance and what are the steps i need to take to get there it's still pretty muddied and i've got to we've got to look at the tools that we have currently in place uh determine if those tools are actually going to be effective in helping us implement a zero trust model uh also looking at the data and, and finding out where all of the data that we store uh that we process where it's going where is it flowing what cloud is it going to uh what internal systems are interconnecting to where if one system gets compromised the crown jewels as jerry pointed out earlier get compromised versus the bologna sandwich um and really doing that that strong mapping of inventory of systems and where your data is going in those systems and then the the, the last piece here is this is this is a journey there's not a finish line to it so it's not the specific project plan that you take care of these you know 25 steps and boom you're done you don't have a fedramp certification fedramp authorization it's it's going to be an evolving thing that's consistently going to change over time and different products and different use cases are going to continue to come out so it's it's really going to be a change in mindset and i think that's one of the biggest challenges that we see is is moving from the old to the new and to, to kind of follow up i did mention kind of the fed ramp as an authorization but are there any policy or compliance challenges that you see nicole going along with zero trust implementation i do i mean at least when i talk to other people everybody tries to wrap the frameworks that exist today that the government has out there as a federal contractor and how you map those to your compliance and meet zero trust and I actually personally don't see it as much of a challenge because we can go to the framework. So if I look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, it starts with identify. Well, it's the same uh, foundational pillar of zero trust. I can't, I have to know what I have. I got to know what my systems are. I got to know what my services are. I got to know what my data is. I got to know what my applications are. I can't protect anything next step in the NIST CSF if I don't know what I have. So we've all been doing that already. So, you know, the term zero trust and how do I accomplish it? You can leverage a lot of the things out there. Identify, know what you have. If you don't know what you have, you can't protect it. And if you can't protect it, you can't detect, respond, and recover when something happens. So it all starts uh, to me with the identification of what you have and then being able to map how your risk tolerances are going to exist to what you have, that bologna sandwich versus your crown jewels type of thing. So which things, you know, from a technological standpoint, do you want to put behind 10 doors that somebody has to go through um, and then get into the, the safe in the underground bunker before they can get to it? And what things from a technology standpoint are less sensitive. You know, when I when I think about AFS, I can think about like our time system. It can't get anywhere else. Um, so it's a very low risk tolerance for us. Got to enter your time. Okay. You know, I'm less worried about the device you're on, where you're coming from, other things, and mainly focused on identity because if you get into it, you can't go anywhere else. Um, and then, you know, there are things that we have a lot of compliance checks for because those are the crown jewels or I don't like the crown jewels. I like to say the Coca-Cola secret formula. Um, you know, that's where you have to go through those, all those checksums before you can actually get to that information. But we can use a lot of the, the policies, procedures, frameworks that have all been developed today and map that to zero trust because they're they're foundational for getting us to this next layer. Um, it's just a different way of implementing technology than the perimeter-based methodology we used in the past. So what do you see as, uh, Mike, as technical challenges to consider for a large-scale zero trust implementation? Yeah, I think the 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 biggest one is 
there's not a single product, there's not a single solution that's out there that's going to get you to be this zero trust, uh, you know, ultimatum. It's it's a scenario where we've got lots of products that are in place. There's, there's lots of software sprawl. I see it with customers. I see it internally. And trying to get the products that we currently have today help us to achieve this mindset and this concept. Um, you know, we, we have privileged access management solutions and like, and now it's really enhancing those solutions, doing deeper dive user entitlement checks and ensuring that the right people have only the access that they need to, to accomplish their job functions. You know, the, the concept of least privilege is key and, um, you know, making sure that there's appropriate checks along the way and that you don't get into a scenario where um, there's too much access. And it's it's also with your integrations as well. It's understanding what machine to machine type of uh, connections do you have and really mapping where if there was a single point of failure, if there was a compromise, that you are able to turn that off and turn off the access to where your, your sensitive data is and be able to, to quarantine and take action. So I think that's that's been probably, or is one of the biggest challenges is really trying to identify what products we have that can help us and then also integrating you know, those products and making sure that those products can integrate and work together so we're not operating in these silos. So Nicole, I'm gonna jump in a little bit onto what, what AFS is doing. So how is, how is AFS adopting a zero trust methodology? Yeah, well, we're on the same zero trust journey as everybody else's. Um, but one of the, the key things, and it resonates back to what Jerry said, is simplification. So I think, you know, one of the things um, uh, I have always been a key advocate for, even when I was even when I was in the government. So when I used to run um, organizational uh, information systems, when I was in the federal government, one of the things that I always that always happened is every vendor came in and they had a great product and then you ended up buying it. And so you had millions of products and none were fully optimized. And that drove me insane. And I've carried that with me out into industry. Um, and that's the, the mantra that I set for AFS. It's got to be simple. It's got to be simple. It's got to be simple. And so when somebody comes to me and says, well, this only gets us 85% of the way, you know, we need 10 more products to get, the, do we really need 10 more products? Or do we sit there and say, I know I am at this level right now. Let's figure out how to optimize everything we have at the 85% level. Then we can figure out if we need to go into the, the last little bits. And I think um, we spend way too much time trying to um, make perfection rather than make good. And if we can make good and optimize absolutely everything that we have, you're actually going to be more secure than you are with a ton of different products um, that not everybody knows how to use. They don't all integrate nicely or they don't all play together nicely and you're struggling and you're struggling and you're struggling and then you never get to good. Um, so I am all about simplification and reducing the amount of tool sets that we have to implement zero trust. So finding the the key critical things that can that can help us help us do that. You know, ServiceNow being one of the components of our zero trust architecture that we use in Accenture Federal. Um, again, that service now is our know what you have, you know, um, and that's what we use that tool for. That's our identify tool. Um, and so I am a big proponent of simplification, 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 and don't make perfection the enemy, you know, of moving forward. And I think way too many of us tend to do that. And especially when you get your technologists out there, they want to try absolutely everything and it's great, but it never ends up working and you only create more vulnerabilities in your environment with the more stuff you add into your environment. Um, they say there's so many vulnerabilities in every um, line of code. So the more products you use, they're all developed on code. So that's more products that you have to think about how you're going 
to protect. Um, and that becomes a, a challenge. So that would be my one mantra. And that's AFS's mantra too. Simplification, 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 reduce the amount of tool sets, find the critical ones that you need to do your mission um, and do what it is you're trying to achieve. And then figure out once you have those at optimal, how do you add on anything else? And do you actually really need it? Or are you fully covered with what you actually do have? So that's that's the biggest thing that we are doing in AFS right now. Why don't we take it back because we're we're running. What about service now? How get how? What are you guys uh, seeing uh, and doing for zero trust and and how can you overlay that for where the U.S. government needs to go? Yeah, I I think your points of simplify, simplify, simplify are spot on and. The, you know, I look at kind of what's happened in the evolution of the government over the last 10 plus years with the, you know, I look at the DHS CDM program, you know, conceptually with a great idea. Let's get these security products out to the agencies and agencies can, can become more secure by getting licensing to all of these products. And kind of what happened over the years is there's lots of great products Give, each agency has licensing to just about anything they could want or need from a security perspective. However, they didn't integrate. And so there, there's lots of shelfware that's out there and there wasn't that integration. It wasn't getting to the point where you're using the tools to the optimal capability and, and being able to um, solve your problems with, you don't need more tools all the time. You, there's there's plenty of tools out there that you can put in a kind of an optimal mix where the tools work together. And that's one of the areas that 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 we've been able to leverage our own, our own platform, ServiceNow, is through a lot of the integrations. When you look at the integrations and the tools that are out there from a security perspective, our platform isn't necessarily you know, focused on specific security feature or specific security features that they're trying to trying to address instead we are the workflow engine behind um you know integrating all of these different security tools in and different products so you know that's that's absolutely something that we've adopted as well um you know some of the specific areas that that we've been doing on you know kind of tactically is is really looking more around our our data and where our data flows go and making sure that we've got proper segmentation across all of our environments, whether they're our customer cloud, whether they're our government cloud, whether they're our internal corp IT, and, and really making sure that, okay, we're, we're, we're cutting off any communication that's unnecessary and making sure that communication that is necessary, we've got the appropriate controls in place from a privilege access management capability. That's great. Yeah. So I think we're we're at we're getting close to where we're going to take questions. So I think the last thing we want to leave everybody with that we'll both do is like what the key piece of advice is. And I think that the number one thing is, and you've heard it said many times, is that zero trust is a journey. What your zero trust architecture and journey looks like today is going to be very different five years from now. The principles are all still going to apply, but technology is going to change five years from now. Um, and so you have to you have to implement um, something that's flexible and adoptive for as you know technology changes and allows you to continue to use what you have without re-architecting every single time. And the other piece of advice I would say is don't try to do it all at once. Everybody here has foundational elements of zero trust today, um, whether you realize it or you don't. Um, every single person does um, because you have some of those elements from our old castle and moat um, that carry on to where we are today. So you, know, you really have to look at zero trust as what's your journey to get more and more secure as you go along. Um, and I like to say, don't try to eat swallow the elephant whole, eat it like one spoonful at a time, be good at one thing before you start on the next thing. Um, and I think we, we all tend to try to tackle so much because we want to get there sooner or faster. Um, and that just tends to lead to more issues than trying to, you know, take it slow um, and recognize that you're in this for the long haul. I absolutely concur. Um, you know, the 
the whole don't boil the ocean. To, you know, it's there's so much to digest with zero trust and changing, you know, mindsets of where you are today, what you're what what the government is doing, what industry is doing. And, you know, really, really take the time to effectively plan out what your journey is going to look like. Um, you know, I think Jerry, Jerry slides up there, they are one of the most advanced agencies in rolling out zero trust. And he's already got plans through FY24. So, you know, you're looking at this, this is this is two plus years of, of an organization that's that's pretty darn mature in this program. So um, take a look at, you know, what you truly want to accomplish. Some of the first steps, really inventory, you know, understand what would what you have under your control, understand where your data is going. And then from there, you can start effectively planning out the long-term approach and the long-term strategy. So, so yeah, with that, we're, we're um, open to questions. We tried to make sure we left enough time so people could ask questions. Anything that you would like to ask of us? Yes, sir. Within the Zero Trust framework, what do you guys see are opportunities for setting up continuous monitoring and auditing um, the continuous monitoring dashboards that you see? Can I start or you want me to? Okay. Um, well, that's, to me, continuous monitoring is a foundational element of zero trust um, because we, we just said we're in continual verification and validation that you are the right user um, on the right device with the right data. Um, and so that is, to, in my humble opinion, a continuous monitoring type of tool that you could think about. Um, and there's all sorts of, there's varying dashboards and different ways to look at continuous monitoring. You can look at continuous monitoring from the health of your user and uh, the health of the endpoint that they're on. Um, but you can also look, like I said, at continuous monitoring. Is this really the, the person that, that I want? And um, you can set that up and uh, create dashboards. So you know that, or automation more, so to speak, that security and automation portion is where I think continuous monitoring comes in that we heard Jerry talk about that, you know, if something changes with that user, that they are automatically disconnected or have a lower um, uh, entry point into the environment so that they are not being able to access the Coca-Cola formula. They can only get to your time system. Um, and so um, I don't know that the traditional continuous monitoring dashboards are going to stay the same as we move forward. Um, it's going to be more about how you're interacting and who's interacting with the data. And is that at the policy levels and the risk acceptance tolerance levels that you as your um, enterprise have defined. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that I see too with Zero Trust is figuring out what your risk tolerance is. Um, again, when we went to that castle and moat, everything was in the castle behind the moat and behind the walls. So pretty much everything was protected at the same level. Um, and in this new world that we're all living in, um, that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, you are going to have to change risk tolerances and set those policies for the different types of things you have. And um, I think that's one of the, the things that I find um, the hardest to um, get people to wrap their heads around because everybody's like, well, zero risk, zero risk, zero risk. We all take risks today. We don't live in a zero risk environment today. Um, we're all taking risk today. Um, so getting people to wrap their minds around the fact that, you know, moving forward, you're going to take risk and you're going to be able to show where you're, you're, cutting off access where it should be um, and automating that. So, cause if you try to do it manually, it's too late. What about you? I, I, I would agree. I think that, you know, when I think of continuous monitoring on the federal side, I think of the, you know, vulnerability scans, polyam type element. I think what we're talking about here from a zero trust perspective is that paradigm shifts more to your state, your, your typical security operations center and more of the real time, real time alerting and shutting off of access and, 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 and relooking at risk on more of a continual basis 
more operationally more so than, than the compliance aspect. Any other questions? I'm, I'm good. Uh, so I understand how it uh, improves confidentiality and integrity uh, internally with how does the Bureau of Social Security do any improvement on general Yeah, you want to start this time first? Oh, I'll let you start. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think uh, I think it's a I, I think it's a good question. I mean, I, I do look at question. it much more from the confidentiality and integrity it perspective. It's a great question. Um, I do think that ultimately we're looking to not impact availability, right, and not not degrade user experience and the like. I do think that there are improvements for availability in the sense that you're able to to shut off access if there's a potential compromise in one part of your environment to where it's not going to affect your entire environment to potentially bring down your your entire environment um and and you're able to to more effectively keep your environment up and available if you're able to shut down kind of adversaries much earlier in the process before they can get too deep into your environment so I, I'm going to agree with that. And I'm going to say that I do think that Zero Trust focuses definitely much more on the confidentiality and integrity of the data, but those lead to the availability of data. So, um, you know, um, if your data is compromised, then it's not available. Um, it may be available, but it's not right. Um, so, um, you know, you have to start. That's, I think, why it goes in the CIA framework confidentiality, integrity, availability. So if you don't have the first two, the third one really doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, um, so I think when we talk about zero trust, um, it leads us to the availability standpoint. Um, I also think that in the way that we thought about availability in the past too, changes. So again, we're not putting everything in data centers anymore. We don't, you know, have to have, you know, these huge um, business continuity failovers that we all used to have to do in the past from one data center to another data center um, and making sure that, you know, you are on different power grids and different things so that, you know, you had, you had full availability of your data at all times. Now, as we make the move to the cloud, some of that availability matters comes in. So that's where I think the confidentiality and integrity take a little bit more of a priority. As we move to the cloud, you're getting that inherent availability that exists um, from cloud services. But again, the it's the availability of your particular data. And so if that confidentiality and integrity isn't uttermost with that data that you're hosting in that cloud, then while it may be available, it may not be right. What other questions? Nicole, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, first of all, great, great presentation from you and Mike both. Um, I love, love, love the message, simplify, simplify, simplify. I think that's very, very key. Uh, one of the things you touched upon was trying to maximize and optimize the tools that you're using before you go out and 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 look uh, for additional tools, and and I can imagine maybe for the audience here that's a lot easier said than done. You know, as managers, you know, can you explain a little bit? How, how do you monitor that? How do you manage that? How do you know when is the right time to get a new tool, and how, and how do you justify that next step? Um, and and yeah, appreciate some of your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, when we're when we are looking at new products. Um, uh, I have a policy that you have to, that anybody that comes to me that says we have to make a new investment, that you have compared it against what we already have in the environment. So does what we have in the environment, can it actually meet it? And you can come and tell me that new tool A is 100%, but our current tool B is 85 or 90, and I'm going to force you to stick with the 85 or 90. Um, I am not going to go invest um, in something new. Let's invest in what we have that can do it. And that's really about what the policies are that you set um, uh, for your 
workforce. So if you want your workforce always out, you know, looking at new, exciting things, yes, they can do that. But you also have to say, you really have to give me the right business case to make me want to invest in something new. And that's just something I have put out across the enterprise. Don't come to me with something new unless you can really tell me why what we have can't do um, what this new thing is. And, um, you know, that's, that's really a standard that, you know, um, you can choose or, you know, um, to implement, or, you know, you can, you can choose not to, but I will tell you that what I have learned over my years running, um, networks in the federal government, 20 plus years, you know, retired SES, 20, 25 plus years. I hate giving away my age. Um, you know, running, uh, networks in the federal government, um, from, you know, the SCI down to the unclass level, um, and now being out in the industry that if you don't put that in place, you are going to end up with a technological um, mess. Um, uh, and you're, you're going to constantly be requ requesting additional resources that you probably won't get because now you have way too many tools and not enough people that know how to run them. Um, you have way too many tools that aren't integrated and not enough people to make that happen. Um, so it's really a forcing function and a policy decision that you can make as a, as a leader in your organization. Great, uh, great answer. Thanks for that. Uh, another follow up question. You know, we're you know certainly from a service now perspective, we're a SaaS based provider. You know, there's a number of executive orders from the federal government looking for agencies to move to the cloud. Does moving to the cloud make zero trust easier to achieve or, or harder? Okay. Uh, um, so we are a cloud first organization. Um, Accenture is a cloud first organization. Um, and uh, zero trust has to me nothing to do about cloud. Um, you know, whether your data is in a cloud or your data is in, you know, one of those data centers, you know, um, in Leesburg or off 234 in Manassas, it doesn't matter. You know, um, it's zero trust is about constant verification, validation, trust, but verify you know, right user, right device, right data at the same point in time. So does it really matter if your data is in the cloud or does it matter if your data is in a, uh, in a warehouse somewhere? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, so I look at the journey to cloud as meeting what we talked about before, that availability function of the confidentially integrity and availability. So cloud really helps achieve that availability standard in a much easier way. But the other two principles for zero trust, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter where your data is um, or where your user is um, because the principles apply no matter what. Want to add on? Yeah. And I'd agree. I think at the, at the end of the day, it's where you're knowing where your data is located. Uh, where where your data can be accessed, and regardless of whether it's sitting in, you know, data center that you own, manage, and operate, or if it's being hosted by you know a cloud provider. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Nicole, for sitting down with the fireside chat with me. I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody out in the audience. We appreciate the, the time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. You have a wonderful day. Thanks, guys. All right, everyone. Thank you. I know you guys are all having good conversation, but we're going to wrap this up with a little bit of nerd talk on some zero trust stuff. My name is Will Coffey. I'm with Accenture Federal Services. I'm with our ServiceNow Business Group. Uh, I'm one of our certified master architects. I specialize in the security and risk portion of the platform. That's not really that important. What we've got is David Paradin from ServiceNow, Office of the CISO. We've got Dave Dolling, our cyber CTO. We've got Sean Wells, who is uh, one of our managing directors in our cybersecurity practice, who specializes in zero trust, right? He's our zero trust owner. So today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to have a panel discussion. We've heard a lot of good stuff from 
Jerry, and you've heard a lot of great stuff from Mike and Nicole. And a lot of that is a lot of the standard zero trust things like what is zero trust? Why is it important? What are we doing about it? Have you seen the executive order? You know, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but what I want to do now is talk about the nuts and bolts of zero trust and talk a little bit more in, in the weeds of we're implementing zero trust. What does that look like from a, a ground level? And what are some of the things that when we're implementing it that we're doing or that we're taking into consideration? So I'm going to sit down. I'm going to start posing some questions to these guys, and we're going to get into some, some nerd talk about zero trust. So if you could give yourself a little intro, let everyone know who you are, what you do here. Sure. Thanks. Oh, Mike's on. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, David Peridon. I'm with the Office of the CISO Field Security Team. I've been with ServiceNow for about uh, six years. Um, I was an actual consultant. Then I actually transitioned into a practitioner. So uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Dave Dowling. I've been uh, uh, supporting the federal government for a uh, good amount of years. Uh, I started out in compliance, um, then became uh, an auditor, and then became an engineer, and then became a security analyst um, and running SOX. So I've been able to see uh, the development of Zero Trust over uh, over my lifespan in all aspects of Zero Trust. And so I think if I'm going to bring a little bit different aspect to Zero Trust today than you probably normally will hear. Yeah, I'm Sean. I work on the technology side of Accenture, so less less business suit advisory and more implementation and tech strategy. I come out of the offensive side out of uh, NSA red teaming. So I, I have actually far less defensive experience than I am on the other side of the keyboard trying to break in. Excellent, well, thanks. We've got former consultants, auditors, and people that are gonna break into your stuff, all exciting things to jump into on this stuff. All right, so what I wanted to start with is, you know, we, we kind of jumped into what does zero trust mean to you and the other ones, but really, in the trenches, what are we doing about zero trust? What, is it, what does it really mean when we're dealing with zero trust? And, and Peridin, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I'm responsible for um, managing FedRAMP instances for our ServiceNow Cloud. And one of the you know, things that I had to go through was to onboard um, you know, customers into our cloud. But for my specific case, um, and when it comes to zero trust, I had to go through a process of being allowed into our GCC environment, right? So, you know, things such as you know, identity and access, I had to basically, you know, get adjudicated, um, get approval from my, my manager, Mike Rode. He was just here in that last panel discussion. And, um, you know, now that I've been onboarded into FedRAMP, um, what I've had to, or what I actually have to do is essentially I log in with my token. I, I, I basically have to access various resources. I have to jump through hoops, various hoops, you know, in terms of accessing our VPNs that's going to specialize in terms of terminating connections into, into GCC. And then once I'm inside, then I'm able to take a look at certain things such as uh, customer instances. Are there any sort of approvals that I, had, I need to go through? Um, you know, like say, for instance, if there's a sales order, and I have to approve a ServiceNow instance, I have to make sure that this customer is uh, going to be, you know, uh, properly um, provisioned correctly and, you know, vetted and so forth. But um, throughout that whole experience, I'm constantly getting challenged. I just can't move laterally or, you know, essentially do something a little bit, you know, uh, um, abnormal. I'm being tracked, I'm being logged on a, you know, a case by case basis. Um, you know, so I, I do have to take training. So that's another aspect of zero trust that we don't really talk about. And there was something earlier you mentioned in terms of, uh, there was a question by this gentleman here by uh, continuous monitoring. The, so when I have to access, you know, these various systems within our GCC environment, the continuous monitoring activities that we're taking or we're actually executing is, all right, where is Dave going? Is he accessing, you know, our uh, high wave or basically our now support portal? But then also he's taking a look at certain um, cloud um, instances. Am I accessing the information for the right reasons, right? So all that information is being tracked. Um, there was another question specific to availability. I want, I was, so wanted to jump up and ask or answer this question. When it comes to availability uh, in the context of zero trust, hopefully I'm not getting you know, too long-winded here. 
Um, like an owl. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, when it comes to the availability of it, you know, we're we're talking about. I think Jerry talked about it this morning. Um, basically, assume breach. Right. If you're assuming a, a breach, you are now having to take a look at your current processes, your procedures. How do you get that system or that application or service back online? Right. So you're going through your incident response process and so forth. Once you have that sort of policy um, in place, right, you're able to get back to your business. So that is an, another variation, if you will, of availability, making sure that you have those, um, you know, those, those response pr processes or plans in place in order to reestablish that actual application. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have to say there. No, that's good. That's good. So, Sean, I'll jump to you and talk a little bit about that from a zero trust perspective. Like, what is that? What are we doing when it comes to zero trust? And we're talking about implementation size. Like, what does that really mean? Yeah, I mean, we, we largely break the conversation down, I guess, in industry as a risk-based approach to identity and a risk-based approach to data access. But when we distill that, perhaps we can start talking about the need for dynamic operations, where how do we get telemetry from endpoints to enable continuous monitoring, to enable uh, this, this autonomous resiliency. So we start diving in to almost these progressive safeguards where we want to take a, I, I guess you told me to get technical. So what we end up doing is, let me drop these. So what we end up doing is actually getting into things like, how do we start infusing threat intelligence where we know the bad actors are behaving in certain ways, dropping certain malware samples, using certain techniques, codify that in some sort of data taxonomy that says bad guys are dropping a malware, here's a signature. Bad guys are attacking us through the following network patterns, here's their signature, and autonomously feeding that into something like a web application firewall or AWS private link or something like that. So what we end up doing is distilling this risk-based risk conversation to a series of almost telemetry collection what are they doing? How is the system performing? How is it configured? How do we get that in real time to drive kind of these autonomous decisions? And when we put it all together, the idea is to assume breach. Um, so we have Department of Energy unsealed three indictments of Russians who were, what, four weeks ago, uh, publicly acknowledged they've been inside of SCADA networks in uh, in I think it was the Western region. Uh, DOD just released their CIO strategy for zero trust, acknowledging for, well, at least from my knowledge, the first time the CIO said, yeah, we have adversaries in the network, openly acknowledging that. So if we have this real-time autonomous system to collect near real-time data, we can drive uh, this, this resilient infrastructure. And, and that is how we try and actually make it actionable instead of talking, you know, thematically maturity, thematic risk. Um, what does that mean, though, no, actionable? Like, what are we doing with it? What do we do with the telemetry? So we start building these capabilities. Like, if we take um, risk-based user identity, I think we talked about a couple times today. An example of that is we we work with technology partners like like a CrowdStrike, Apollo, or Sentinel One to get technology. Sorry, to get telemetry from the laptops. How they're configured? Are they DoD stigged? Are they FISMUD? Are your Win10 images configured a certain way? Is the hardware attestation down to the BIOS patched and things like that? And we almost create a device trust score to say, do we even want this device on our network? From there, we start monitoring user behavior. You'll hear it called end user analytics or Yuba. But the idea is if I'm normally working from nine to five, I log in at 2 a.m., that's abnormal. If I'm logging into a data source that I haven't, that's abnormal. So how do I combine the trustworthiness of the device with the pattern of behavior from the user and create a trust score? Um, so that trust score then informs, do we want to have them re-authenticate every hour because they're being a little weird? How, would it, how do we know it's still Sean? Do we want to have the device require new patches because they're out of date? Um, so all of that technology if I'm answering the question right, yeah. is is kind of how we start scaling the the how behind this. And all of those kind of start to fit into the pillars of zero trust. 
Yeah, and that's that's been areas. one of our, our big challenges. So we we have this thematic guidance of how do we get from traditional, you know, average to operational excellence across the pillars of device, network identity, and so forth from CISA. DoD has their own. But a challenge we've had is you'll you'll see thematic guidance like use a risk-based approach and how do we translate that? So in the FISMA world or or the ATO world, we have the NIST 853 control catalog and somebody in security gave us a spreadsheet of like, here's the controls you have to meet and you answer them. But how do you answer thematic? Do you do a risk-based approach? Um, that translation often gets fundamentally technical very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's where we start seeing people have, have trouble. Yeah, that makes sense. So... Dave Dolling, when we talk about those things and we look at, and Jerry talked about it a little bit earlier, other technologies that are in the surrounding environment or ecosystem around zero trust, things like SASE, like how does that fit into the picture? Um, I kind of address a little bit what we were talking about first, and then I'll jump into that yeah. and tie it all together. So, I mean, zero trust has been around, is actually, we were talking about how long it's been around, right? It's been around so early '90s, I invented it in the '80s, um, and you know Google came out in the in the early 2000s, and then Sunburst happened, right? And it was like, oh no, we need to actually make it real. It went from a compliance check based to a technical, and and I I think I mean if you actually look at compromises, uh, they said 34 percent of compromises are directly related to human error, right? The other are supply chain, also human error right? Or internal configuration issues, also human error. So when you actually think about it, it's all human error when it comes down to, you know, how we get compromised, right? Somebody made a mistake somewhere. Um, and so when we switched from, hey, you know, here are the things that you need to do as a bare minimum to everyone is an insider threat. Everyone is a threat, right? We got to remove that and, and get to that, to that aspect where we're treating everyone the same if they're an ATP or if they're, you know, the, uh, David and, and Sean sitting next to me, I treat them the same when it comes to security, right? I wouldn't trust them either. I, I know, right? No. <laughs> um, but so when it comes to like SASE and it comes to uh, the, the goal of SASE is to get those protections as close to the data and as close to the endpoint as possible. Maybe it would be helpful because I don't think everyone in here knows what that is. What is SASE? Um, secure Access Service Edge. All right. So it's making sure, you know, moving the, the automation, moving the protections, moving the detections um, down as close to, you know, on your endpoint, um, around the data. You know, as we always talk about, uh, you know, we're moving away from the perimeter. Uh, some people are saying data is the new perimeter. Don't necessarily fully agree with that. But I do agree that data and humans are the two things that you need to protect the most, right? You need to protect around the human and you need to protect around the data. And so as you're, you're going out of the human, right, you, you're having that automation, you're having those detections as it going to access the data and leaving the data, you're also having that. And that's where the SASE comes in is you're protecting those two aspects, which are the most critical aspects, the per people making the mistakes and the, the crown jewels, as you may call them. All right. I like it. Paradin. Yes, sir. It's all zero trust created equal. Oh no, no, zero trust is not uh, is not created equal. Um, a perfect example of this is again, I just mentioned how our environment is set up, right? Um, you would have to essentially, you know, uh, take inventory. I think Mike Brody said it earlier. I think Jerry said it as well. Um, take an inventory of what you have in your organization, where you're in your. Uh, your infrastructure, and then, you know, taking, uh, you know, performing a gap analysis, right? Understanding where your gaps are. And then we saw those pillars that were thrown up on the board, red, green, yellow. Actually, I like that approach. Um, but, you know, essentially, if you're able to take inventory rather efficiently, oh, one thing, um, I think it was another question about uh, tool set. I think it was Michael, you said that. Um, I want to address that. To, to select the best tool, sorry if I'm going off topic here, but I'll get back to it. Um, to address like, you know, the selection of a tool. Uh, I was talking to David earlier. Uh, you can set up a dashboard and have that vendor essentially, um, you know, give you a trial period, what have you. And then, you know, you can measure the efficacy of that actual tool or tools 
And now you're able to provide the evidence back to that vendor, right? Um, ben Prime, I'm not sure if you're in here or not, but here he is in the back, my colleague, former colleague. We've, we've set this up all day long in terms of setting up these dashboards and then providing accountability to you know, those respective vendors. Now you have the ability to make a decision all right, is Splunk better than Logarithm and so forth? So in terms of selecting, I agree with everything with that, uh, that uh, um, I forgot the person's name again, um, that was sitting in this chair. Nicole, thank you, um, what, she, what she mentioned. However, you can also add in the, the leveraging technology to help you make that decision, especially when budget comes into play. So from my perspective, if you're trying to protect the crown jewels that we're talking about, um, I don't think you should put a price tag on it because, you know, if you start to compromise that, that you will have some sort of like, um, you know, weakness that will develop that will then lead to a breach, right? So I think having a, 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 an actual tool efficacy dashboard is one way to help you select um, your respective technology. Now, getting back to what you were mentioning, not all organizations are, are the same in terms of zero trust or how you basically it's implemented. It really depends on your people, your technology and your process and how mature you are. And what you're doing, right? Because you're talking a lot about it from like the cloud vendor yep. sort of perspective. So Dave or Sean, like how does that, what does that mean from a zero trust implementation perspective? Like are all zero trust environments created equal from the other side, from the client side, from our side, so, consulting side? Uh, so yeah. There, I mean, not all vendors are created equal. And again, we were talking about this and it really comes down to um, the cutting edge perfect tool is only as good as the configuration and the people that are doing it, right? You could have something that meets 100% uh, of the requirements, but if you don't configure it right or have the people to run it right, then it's not doing you any good. Um, and, you know, going off that is doing those assessments. I mean, we do um, AOA's alternative analysis all the time. Um, and we do, what we do is we do uh, continuous purple teaming. Um, and this really um, comes in with a technical aspect where we're actually doing adversary emulation inside the network, running real tests, running, you know, Log4j or Sunburst or uh, any of the, you know, the latest hacks. Um, and it really changes the, the perspective, right? And it's, of course, not everything is created equal um, and it, it changes with every customer. And so when we run these tests, we find the gaps. We find, is it a configuration issue? Is it a people issue? Is it a tool issue? Or is it a detection issue? Or is it a response issue, right? Um, there's more than just, hey, I'm gonna go buy Palo and we're done. No, I need to buy Palo. I need to implement it correctly. I need to integrate it correctly. I need to configure it. I need to teach. I need to write detections. And then I need to, you know, have an incident response plan. And so, I mean, there's, again, the tool is just a small portion of the zero trust and the technology. Now, that, that I would, can, say, I would say that you're defining the right users to having the right accesses, right? For, um, to the right data for the right reasons. That's, that's good. Right. So Sean, you were talking a little bit about dynamic operations and we're talking about kind of the different views from a zero trust ecosystem. When we talk about those dynamic operations and the human element, the technology element, and how that is all implemented into one zero trust strategy, what are some of the considerations that we need to take into account for when we think about all of those different environments and how they're interacting? Well, um, so, so I run the delivery teams on the zero trust side at Accenture, and we generally break the conversation into, are we talking about secure workforce, meaning, meaning the humans and how they access the data, or are we talking about a secure workload on micro segmentation and posture and things like that? So depending how we go, it'll drive where we start. And there's different principles for both? Argue, well... If if uh, nobody, I don't know if CIS is here, but like if we throw out the CIS model, yes. Um, <laughs> so the the idea is we we generally do begin like if we're talking on uh, some of the work we do at Department of Energy, it's publicly acknowledged, it's in the news, and that largely is a focus on secure workforce where they're talking about identity, they're talking about device attestation, they're talking about how their users can access the data. 
Um, meanwhile, we have other public customers within DHS that are talking about secure workload, which is cloud security, posture management, network micro segmentation, secure browsers. So we start, I've never actually phrased it that way, so I may be stumbling, but we generally start on a path down secure work force or a path down secure workload. So figuring out which one's going to be more important, but ultimately you'll do both, right? Yeah, yeah, you just gotta start somewhere. And it's, um, it's not like it's a enablement, right? And in in a in a positioning of like, hey, we're shifting to this new model. Yeah, and as we shift to the new model, eventually we get to the point in delivery where you find commonalities. And Sys has been a leader here where they've started stepping up and providing shared services like protective DNS. Whether you're a user or a machine, you need like protected DNS queries to make sure there's no exfiltration. Um, eventually you start moving into like secure web gateways and secure web browsers, browser isolation um, as a service or shared desktop as a service. You move to a enterprise SOC that actually takes all this telemetry so that you can start making these autonomous decisions from the network to the user to other um, aspects of the infrastructure. And that, I, I'm I'm surprised shared services aren't more clearly art defined in a lot of the maturity models out there. So from a compliance perspective, and any of you can answer this, how does zero trust fit into the existing compliance models that are out there? That's very vague, I know, but I did that on purpose. Not, not necessarily. So you have the, uh, the memo 2209 that came out. Um, and in that one specifically, they talk about the automation of technical assessments, right? So again, I've, I've been an ISSO, so I've been the one that's writing and validating internal compliance. I've been the assessor running DHS's compliance team where I assessed, you know, hundreds of DH DHS assessments. So I know from assessment perspective, and then I've also been the engineer, right, where I've been audited on my technical implementations. And so... I know how to get around any assessment, right? Like I know how to answer the question legally, <laughs> right? Where I'm not, I'm not in violation of ethics, um, but and get past. That's the problem, right? We can't, we have to get away from this paper-based compliance assessment and going to that technical assessment and automated technical assessment. Now there is an open source uh, project going out there with, um, to be able to do that, you know, through markdown languages and stuff and, and do that. And I know uh, in, in Splunk and in Elastic, you know, we have dashboards now that are, you know, searching for technical controls and having dashboards and stuff that if you're meeting them, that's the way we have to go with compliance, right? Is we have to get to the point where it's AI saying you are compliant or not. And then actual technical assessment saying, yes, you are compliant um, and not should not be anything with, you know, hey, here's a 600 page document <laughs> of how I'm compliant. And I read it. Well, hey, that sounds great. Good. You're good to go. Right. We have to get away from that. I agree. <laughs> So do as a, a as a former assessor, like looking at the system security plan, everyone raise their hand who know what an SSP is, right? Oh my god! Oh my gosh! Like that document, it will put you to sleep. Yeah. Well, I I think it doesn't have to suck. So um, <laughs> we're I, doing a couple things maybe to to raise awareness of. Um, the first problem is we 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 implement a service, whatever it is, protective DNS. You get your NIST 853 control catalog, you decorate your spreadsheet, usually by hand. And what we're trying to move towards um, are really two technologies, as the royal we being the work we do with NIST. The first is something called SCAP, Security Content Automation Protocol. It was actually mandated in the bowels of DHS CDM. And the idea is to create a data taxonomy that will give us structured pass or fail for technical controls. So in the DOD world, imagine an operating system stig of our passwords the right length, this crypto turned on. In applications, maybe whatever technical controls is TLS enabled. The idea is if I can get a pass or fail check, I have a data taxonomy for operating systems, middleware applications, that will give me a structured red light, green light. And I decorate that data taxonomy that says, um, 
NIST control X makes you do the following. At the operating system, you might turn on the auditing subsystem. At the application layer, you make sure it generates user login and log off events. And you start layering operating system to application and, and so forth in your infrastructure. What SCAP allows us to do is find the gap. So if your operating system is providing a shared control, maybe your application server doesn't need to. If your application itself is doing something, maybe your operating system won't need that. And driving that is usually a human assessment process that takes forever in many spreadsheets. The idea of SCAP is to automate it. Um, so that gets us through how we technically get this telemetry uh, on an ongoing basis for the controls, technical controls. So now, whether we want to tie that into themes of continuous monitoring, where I run the scan every day, every hour, every time there's a deploy, and it empowers ISOs to say, when I developed this a month ago, here's the baseline. I did incremental Git commits or software commits or pushes. Here's the drift over time, and I can compare that. And, and that's all well and good. Simultaneously, there is something to be aware of called OSCAL, O-S-C-A-L. And it's another data taxonomy out there that layers in the human people process technology side of the accreditation. So I can structure my answer to allow me to say, this is how I do backups. This is how I do risk-based identity. This is how I do whatever. Um, so when we marry these together, what kind of Dave is getting at is we now have programs dynamically generating system security plans. No more human requirement traceability matrices. No more 5,000 page Word documents. We take the technical telemetry from endpoints defined as you know, virtual machines, laptops, web servers. We take the human prose that was structured in a certain way, and it allows us for things like DoD Platform One, uh, it allows us for some of the DevSecOps environments at DOE to actually dynamically build our SSP to verify every technical control with every software push or every period of time, like every Monday morning. And I would argue that that's been one of the major wins of this whole zero trust thing is making people aware the need for technical telemetry to drive these autonomous decisions. Um, so now, you know, for niche areas and an ever growing amount of niche areas, we don't have the six month ATOs. Uh, we set up the manufacturing process in a very specific way, which, which is a little bit slower than normal, but once we're live, ATOs are dynamic. Um, yeah, I think uh, another part of it, sorry, Dave. Yeah, I think another part of it is it's also changing it from letter of the law to spirit of the law kind of thing. Um, you know, for example, we all have password requirements. I remember when it was eight characters, then it's 14 characters. And yeah, I mean, how many of you guys feel that your passwords are as secure as they should be? Are you just adding a one? two, three <laughs> yeah. at the end. Are you writing it? I mean, I have to change my password every 30 days, right? Um, it gets a lot of passwords. I can't reuse the same one. Um, that's a letter of the law, right? And it actually is less secure than if they would just let us have a, a, a complex password at MFA. And now we're getting to the point where like, they actually removed the complexity uh, requirement in this last EO, right? They're like, you know what? <laughs> it's stupid. Password complexity is stupid. Right. And now it's no passwords, right? We're getting to no passwords and, and different types of MFA, right? And going back to, you know, the, the risk score of the asset, you know, is it is is it uh, compliant? You know, does it have everything I want? Can I force things before they can access it? Um, it's all with the compliance portion of it. It was zero trust. It's changing the way we've looked at security and putting it and making it truly secure instead of um, just what somebody in one place thinks it's secure. Yeah, I would, I would actually add that, you know, if you're thinking about it, you know, in terms of making it easier and more secure, go back 10 years. No one was doing multi-factor authentication with their phones to get into their bank account. We're doing it today, right? So if you think about it, we have progressed, yes. right? So we have made things easier with the inception of AI, machine learning. That is an indication that we are heading in the right direction. And we, we're starting um, within the cyber world. You'll hear about IOMs, indicators of misconfiguration, like a stick. 
uh, IOCs, indicators of compromise, which are retroactive things like uh, a malware sample was found, and IOAs, or indicators of activity. So the idea is as as a as an industry, we started to push away from indicators of misconfiguration and push away from historical indicators of compromise to building real-time indicators of activity. You know, hear this pretty much from every industry sector. The idea that we're trying to shape, um, starting with common criteria, which is uh, the attestation software vendors have to follow, we actually give software vendors now themes that they have to express. Do you have the ability to, in real-time, identify malicious users? Do you have the ability in real time to send telemetry that allows me to make a decision if you're compromised? And we're not getting as granular as those 5,000 NIST controls anymore. So that started with application servers, that started with operating systems, and we're trying to gauge if there's interest to extend that out to the new, new revisions of the NIST risk management framework. So instead of having technical controls, actually being audited on your ability to have organizational agility in decision making. So a lot of the zero trust, I think people, when they think about zero trust, they think of it as like, oh, it's just this new security way of doing business and how I get into stuff. Um, but listening to you guys talk, it sounds like it's a very dynamic and real time repositioning of your security posture all the time. Is, does that does that make sense? And so my question is, if we're looking at these things, is there really, I know we talked that there's no, no one zero trust answer and all those things, but if we're layering technologies on there, MFA came up, authentication, identity is one of the pillars. Like, is there one authentication capability or technology that we're looking at? I mean, right now, could we use 10 different kinds of authentication mechanisms to do zero trust in one environment? So this is actually um, something that we've really been focusing on because there isn't, there isn't an IDAM solution that's FedRAMP high out there. There isn't a single identity solution that meets all the requirements. Um, and so it, this is actually, you know, uh, you know, scope creep or uh, um, access creep, um, shadow IT, stuff like that, all of that, it is probably one of the biggest issues, right? Is knowing your assets, knowing your identities. And so we've actually been really focusing on this. Um, we hired some amazing identity management people and really working on the automation and moving away from, hey, this new person just joined, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna share access with this, with this, with this, with this, instead of going in, hey, this person is a part of this group, this team, this contract with this role and just tag it and automation goes and gives access to everything they need, right? And then as soon as that person removes, moves to a different role, they remove all access just by removing the tags and then give them the new tags again and redeploy all the access, right? All through automation. At any time I need to remove access from data, I remove a tag. I don't have to go and see who has access, legacy access. I'm just removing the tag and the AI, the automation completely takes over and removes all that access. And so you got rid of all of your, you know, um, access creep, right? Uh, I still have access to uh, a, a Twitter account for a company that I don't even work for anymore, right? Because they have never removed access and they've actually called me and said, hey, I, I can you reset my password, right? Um, you know, so it, getting to that so for us, that whole identity management, we've really been focusing on, and, and we now have a FedRAMP high compliant automated identity management solution um, that we can go with. But the, here's the thing is it's not a single vendor. We actually have proven it out with multiple identity management, multiple tools, right? So that we don't come in and say, hey, your investment that you've spent millions of dollars and, and you know multiple years on is no good. We come in and we can say, here are the keys and the aspects that you need to add or change to keep your investment in place and get to that level of zero automated, zero trust identity management that you need to. So the end game of zero trust isn't necessarily find the right technologies to meet the needs of the thing that you're trying to do. It's, you know, let's look at this environment, see what we need to do, try to move towards automation as much as we can but know that you're going to have to dynamically reassess your security environment 
uh, really all the time in yeah. real time all the yeah, time. Yeah, 100%. So we actually have uh, what's called a zero trust uh, um, level up or a maturity model assessment. And Jerry actually is, you know, red light, green light, yellow chart, right? It's very similar to what we have. And the goal is, yeah, we go in, we assess what tools they have, how they're configured. We do technical assessments. And then we come out with, hey, here are your, the technical gaps. Here's the configuration gaps. Here's the people process gaps. Um, because it, there is, like I said, there isn't a tool that fixes it. There isn't, and all of the tools out there are good. I mean, Nicole talked about it. If it's at 80%, right? You have mitigating controls and mitigating tools elsewhere. So you don't need to have 100% tools everywhere, right? You can mitigate that with other tools. So the best place to start with zero trust to me is with the tools you have, <laughs> right? And figure out how to improve them to meet more of the requirements. I know, Sean, you were about to jump in there. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> so I think that zero trust to me seems like an area where the government is leading, right? I think differently than most Often you hear about Silicon Valley or the commercial sector is coming up with some new innovative way of doing things and the government sort of falls in line with that. But to me, it, it seems very flip-flopped here. And I think the government is leading the way in a zero trust implementation. Sean, do you agree or disagree? And why do you agree? Violently disagree. <laughs> um, you played the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's not. It's so. So we have... You know, we have NIST 800-207, which is the zero trust reference architecture. You have the DOD reference architectures. One recently got released. There's been one existing. You have the CISA maturity models. And finally, the White House executive order came out a year ago. And it was really a reflection that, uh, for whatever reason, the intrinsic motivation to modernize our systems towards an adversary first approach wasn't there. So the literal president had to issue an executive order stating explicit guidance to force action. Um, so no, I, I would say that that we're dangerously close to being last. Oh, interesting. I've been taking the mic. Do you want to jump Go in? Ahead. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> I, 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 so I agree. I am thrilled with what the government's been doing with Zero Trust, right? I When EO came out, like little standing applause, right? Because finally it's coming out, it's a requirement. I think the government is setting the baseline. I don't think they're leading in zero trust. I think they're like, all right, guys, customer. I mean, with CMMC even, like everyone here is now the baseline, right? And the baseline is good enough, right? It needs to get better. Um, and so like, I love what they've been doing. Um, it is a requirement. Uh, but if you actually think about uh, the last, one of the last studies I said uh, studied was the CISO, an average lifespan of a CISO is less than two years, yeah. right? And uh, and with the government, with budgets, with procurement, right? I mean, you start adding that is they'll come in, they try to make it some change, you know, CISO tries to make a change and then they're moving on, you know, before anything changes. And so you don't really get that consistency or on the commercial side, there's a little bit more consistency when it comes to that. Um, and so they can progress further and they're all about the bottom line and return on investment. And I've worked for nonprofits and commercial both ways, and it's a different return on investment. On the commercial side, I need efficient, I need fast, I need good, right? Um, and on the federal side, they don't necessarily have those, right? I need good and I need cheap, right? <laughs> um, and so again, they there is that baseline, but we are getting there. And I think a lot of the vendors are really helping out. Like we're really working with vendors and you know, like I support CISA directly, and I am sitting down with vendors and saying, here are the government requirements, make changes to meet these requirements. And they are. And so they are leading the aspect in that is they have enough power and weight to go to these vendors and say, hey, if you want to play in our zero trust, you know, that playground, you need to make improvements. Um, and so overall, I think it is making vast improvements for the industry itself. I couldn't agree more. Um... I like to, I'm not sure why I'm trying to go back and hit you like I'm a history buff or something, but I'm not. <laughs> um, just going back to like, say, when DARPA, when that that basically was created, right? Um, I couldn't have said it better, you know, or you couldn't have said it better. I mean, I know you had my same name, but um, 
baseline is a great way of saying it. maybe not leading, but you know, definitely we're you know the government has been the baseline. Now it's up to the private sector and other markets to bring that innovation and, and expand it even further. That way we're collectively able to progress. So I completely agree. So from a zero trust end game, where do you think currently? Like, what are we looking at, Sean? Or they, anyway, actually, you were going to talk. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to take a page out of what these two guys just mentioned um, relative to the last question. I'm not sure if there is an end game, right? That we're that we're constantly evolving. We're 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 changing um, this movement to, for digital transformation, right? When you fully transform, right? Are you done? Probably not, right? So I think that with zero trust, and from my perspective, um, we can hope to achieve an end game, but I think you're always going to strive for better. I would say we, it, it's the realization, I, I've never had to word this. We, we, by taking an adversary first approach, we realize we need to move away from indicators of misconfiguration and a way of basing our entire ATOs on indicators of compromise towards the ability to create indicators of activity that drive real-time awareness. As I said, I'm going to take a very different view on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so to me on the end game is so I've been through with the government when we were on-prem. Like I remember server clouds and I would go and physically touch those. Um, and then we're like, you know what? We're not good at hardware management. We're going to move to private cloud. So we stood up, you know, DC1, DC2. Uh, I remember we created rack packs. Like, so we actually created a, a server rack. We built it, configured it, and then we'd ship it out places that would uh, home run to, to the, the federal data centers. Uh, and then we realized they're not good at it. So we went back, government. We went back and started doing on-prem again. Uh, government started doing on-prem, right? Um, and then we're like, hey, this cloud thing, you know, this is pretty good. And so we moved to the cloud. Um, I also remember when we uh, when we set up nine or a, a DHS, um, uh, Coast Guard managed our email, right? Um, and then we tried to have HP do it and stuff. And finally, Microsoft came out and said, hey, we'll do this as a, a service. And no one's looked back, right? You're on Google, you're on Microsoft. No one's managing their own own. Uh, uh, email anymore. And for the most part, no one's managing their own hardware. There's very few. We're, I mean, we're now a cloud uh, only, cloud first, and we're, we're moving to the cloud. Um, we are, you know, we used to manage our own ticketing system. I mean, we're at a service now thing. I mean, how many people are managing their own ticketing system? Maybe a few here and there, but for the most part, we're not having service now do it. Um, <laughs> Or you're having AFS Thank you. do it for service now. <laughs> with service now. Right. And so as you you think about like the progression we made, is we realized we are not good at doing things, right? Um, we are good at doing what we do um, and not good at doing other things. Um, and so as you can see, we're moving more to managed services, SaaS and PaaS and IaaS with security. And I think with security. Uh, the end state is not doing security ourselves, right? Is moving to manage services, moving to Azure with their whole Defender suite and their platform is amazing. Palo Alto and their platform is amazing. CrowdStrike and their platform is amazing, right? They are good at what they do. Let them do that so that I can focus on my mission, my goals, Absolutely. and start allowing people that focus on those aspects handling those aspects and now the key is getting them all to work together right um and making sure that we're getting the telemetry we're getting the logs we're getting the data um necessarily to do it and that's where um our shameless plug managed xdr right that is our bread and butter right is uh gathering the telemetry from all of these SaaS and pass and i as an on-prem and bring it together and you know correlating all that into a, a single location and doing those risk scores and asset scores. So to me, that is the end state of, of zero trust is getting to that level of letting everyone be the best of what they are. 
I don't want to steal your thunder for, for a quick second, but um, do we really think that zero trust is the true end game here? We all know something's going to come down the pike here shortly. Just got to give it time. So I completely agree with what you're saying, but we've seen this story written so many times, or we've seen this story before. Something else will come out, right? It already has. Yeah. <laughs> quantum, uh, right. quantum computers uh, and all of our encryption no longer being valid, you know, by they're expecting, what is it, 2026? 20, late 2020s. Yeah, late 2020s, they're expecting that our whole encryption, everything will be void. And uh, yeah, so this is just getting to the aspect, but just, just know we're about to redo this all over again. So just yeah. know the next big thing is we're going to be having a quantum encryption conference <laughs> in the next six years. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. IBM just yeah. released a thousand qubits yesterday. <laughs> yes. Well, what I wanted to do is kind of wrap up down the line here before we get into Q and A, um, giving people the opportunity to ask questions to us as implementers. But just kind of last thought on, you know, any advice from a zero trust implementation. You can start, Sean, and just head down this way. In the same way, nobody rolls their own crypto anymore. Um, stop rolling your own services. So CIS is stepping up to use protective DNS, secure web gateway. You have login.gov for human identities, citizen facing and internal. And, and maybe to riff on a little bit of what Dave said, it's it's utilizing or establishing shared services to, to do in common what's commonly done is a, a very near-term imperative. Um, so I will say to me, I think uh, we really have lost sight of the human element, um, human centric design. Uh, so, I mean, you know, going back to the, the passwords and things like that, um, we need to make sure as we're implementing uh, these security requirements that we're not just pushing the effort onto the users, right? We need to, to be as effective and as secure as possible. We need to make it as easy easy as possible for those users, right? So like with phishing campaigns right now, um, AI can write a phishing campaign that has is more successful than any human can write it. It's, it's pulling from their social media. It's pulling from, you know, correct grammar. It's pulling from, you know, real domains. It's using real services, right? It has got to the point where I, I hate to admit it, have clicked on phishing, you know, phishing stuff because they are so good now, right? We can't rely on just training our employees to be really good. We as service providers and implementers need to make sure that we are realizing that we're not overloading the human um, and their capabilities. Well said. I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm going to keep this really, really brief. But from my perspective, take a look and see what you guys or what your businesses are understanding your business, right? And then aligning that, that business with the respective frameworks. Not all frameworks are the same. So you have to take a look and see what really drives your business for success. Align those uh, those those principles with the various uh, frameworks that's out there, and I think you're going to find out that you're going to have a level of success specific to your business or your agency. So I wouldn't look at other agencies how they're doing it or other organizations. You need to focus on what is allowing your organization to succeed. Right. So from my perspective, I always want to take inventory of my household, what's working for me, what's not working for me, and then kind of go from there. And those are all, those are good. I think those are good thoughts on that stuff. So what I wanted to do is give everyone the opportunity to ask questions if they had any, uh, or what they've got on that stuff. And, you know, feel free. I think you can run the gamut on whatever you want from high level down to low level implementer questions. So bring whatever you got. Any questions? I guess I one over here. Yes. Um, so I think um, that's a good question. So I think it it starts with um, you know taking a look what we have currently. But you know 
specific to um, what she was mentioning, I, from my perspective, I would, you know, essentially make, um, you know, uh, basically create a team, um, but then also uh, that will, uh, let me step back a second. I would actually, you know, start to form an actual team in order for me to really understand uh, what sort of initiatives. And I assume that you're saying this is for, for any customer or is this just strictly for your business? Or will this scale is what I'm trying to ask. Right, so again, I need to get some smarter people in the room to help me understand, look, in order for me to build a solution, right, that is going to meet the masses sort of requirements, I may, I may need to have multiple playbooks, right, that I need to go ahead and follow or to create or develop. From there, um, then I can test out the, the, the efficacy or the effectiveness of those playbooks over time. Go back to those customers and say, hey, I know that we started with this sort of effort in terms of zero trust. It, it's, it's my job to go back and see how they're performing. That way I can improve those templates going forward. Does that make sense? And are, so are you looking from a ServiceNow perspective of like how you would use the platform itself, the applications and stuff on the platform or just how ServiceNow would support that? Got it. Okay. So if it's more product specific, I'm gonna have to go ahead. And no, use. you just said how, well, I think how you would as an organization, as a vendor would support that, right? That's what you're asking? Oh, as a okay. vendor. Um, no, I that's think a, how you answered it, I think, right? Yeah, I, I think that's how I, yeah, I think I would just rely on what I just said um, previously. I wasn't trying um, to cut you off. <laughs> right. Um, so we have various uh, organizations, BUs, you know, that we can help towards that. Um, I think our, uh, you know, office of this, you know, the CISO is that liaison to collect. That's actually my my job, in, in fact, is to collect customer requirements. And then I go internal to, you know, within our company uh, across various pillars, if you will, to assess and see, all right, what sort of services and, and applications can we help customers onboard themselves to leverage the platform to its fullest capability and or the services that we provide. Now, again, we're going to have to assess and make sure that you are succeeding, right? So we do have a customer success group, right? That will, you know, check in on you every once in a while, but we're going to take that actual intel and see how we can make our process a little bit better for future customers. I think it also depends on what level of environment and data you're going to have in your ServiceNow environment, because there are different ways to access ServiceNow, depending on whether you're IL-4, IL-5, whether you're using the DISACAP or self-hosted or self-hosted, all those things, right? So there's a lot of different ways to be able to think about how you're getting to the environment and then how, who can get to the environment and what are they able to do once they're there, right? But I think there's, there's a lot of different ways to crack that nut if you're looking at it in terms of how do I get there? Hopefully I answered that question. Any other questions? Nobody has any. Oh, there you go. You spoke about moving towards uh, indicators of action uh, versus uh, indicators of uh, compromise, I think. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Just maybe give like an example. Uh, I guess from the technical side, uh, or yeah, just. Uh, I mean, the answer is a personal rant, perhaps. So we 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 have our existing ATO system, um, federal ATOs based on indicators of misconfiguration. The NIST 853 catalog is a password ten characters or two or thirty or five. Is crypto left or right? And we have baselines to measure operating systems, application servers, and we, we, we often fail ATOs because of these configuration settings. So to mitigate that, we moved to uh, continuous monitoring. So the idea is every 90, 60, whatever period of time, we go and reassess or you'll have a, a defense cyber uh, CPT come in and do a re-audit. The, the challenge with that is it's all lagging indicators. Um, 
So then you have people like DoD Platform One who will evaluate the configuration during the software build and during the software delivery. And that was kind of the next stage. And you'll hear it called DevSecOps, but in federal, you know, DoD Platform One is kind of the, the pinnacle. And again, that's fine. We're, we're auditing the manufacturing process so that we don't have to continuously audit the output. Almost makes sense. Uh, however, once it once a workload, an environment is operational, well, what do you do? So we then have this pivot towards telemetry. And Dave touched on it where we want to get the data from the network and the SaaS and the endpoints and the virtual machines and throw it into a sock to do something. And that do something is collectively called, you know, IOAs or indicators of activity. So we want to take the telemetry from multiple technologies, your operating system, your network, your identity, your application, and find what malicious behavior looks like um, at a holistic view. So we'll talk about it as extended detection and response or XDR. Um, what actually drives XDR is, is these indicators of activity, the telemetry. So we're, we're trying to pivot ATOs away from rigid compliance of misconfiguration, whether it's done in a build process like platform one, whether it's done periodically like DOD stig scans and actually move towards the collection of this telemetry. I'll add a little more on from the defense side. Um, engineering defense <laughs> um so we have so for example we have uh, our threat intel team um and all they're doing is they're looking and saying hey this attack happened here this attack happened here and here are the indicators of compromise uh and so that it, or indicator yeah so they have like they attacked from this ip they attacked from this url they, they these are the usernames they used here is the locations they came from so those are all uh, indicate uh, IOCs, right? And so we take those and I just block those, right? Hey, I know that bad actor, we're going to block those um, and we get rid of that. That is re retroactive, right? Uh, with the actions, we are looking for, hey, we just got a scan from this IP, which is normal, right? I get scanned from the internet, I mean, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times a day. But then I got scanned and then they tried to log in, right? So now that is activity. That is someone saying, hey, I'm probing your network and I found something that I'm going to try to exploit. So now when I bring those two IOAs together, right? I don't care. I mean, I've already blocked the IPs um, and I, I've blocked the usernames and, and things or domains and things like that. But I'm starting to piece these IOAs together to um, figure out when I'm getting attacked and how I'm getting attacked. And MITRE's come out with a really good with their MITRE attack framework and their MITRE attack, uh, what's the new one? Defense. Uh, defense, right? They came out with the, the, the defense framework as well. Uh, is it's, it's coming up with the ways that people are attacking, where they're at in the kill chain, where they're at in the process, and trying to piece those actions together to look at for compromises. So you're, you're really taking a lot of information and then like back in time, right? And then you're running it through this algorithm in a sense to pick these, or right, hey, this this actual point in time, that's a problem. So we can focus on that. And now we can have that, that actual uh, empirical inf evidence or data to improve our workflows or what have you, right? Um, we are doing it in real time through with AI and ML. Um, so I have a whole content team that that's all they do is build data models specifically for each type of attack. Mm -hmm. Um, and we store all logs over, you know, we store for 18 months to meet the uh, 2231 or 202131 uh, memo. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we, we, we look over the last 90 days, it's called historian. So every time any mm -hmm. new IOC comes in, every time new attack, uh, anything comes in, we, we relook at the last 90 days, but anytime we're also storing everything. So as those data models are coming in, we can say, hey, this is scanned us so many times and get to those beacons. Because the whole point of an attacker right, is to get around those detections, those signature-based detections. Stay dormant, right? Right. And so we, we try to look more for those uh, IOAs because those are you know, 
yeah. more consistent and not something that you would normally detect on a signature. Thank you. Okay. Question in the back. Hi, uh, Sean was talking about XDR. And if you, most of the monitoring companies now moving to XDR platform right now. And if you have XDR, why you need uh, zero trust? Hmm. <laughs> That's a setup. A little bit. If you have XDR, why do you need zero trust? Um, that's like, I don't even know how to decompose that. So the, we end up having XDR to take action. And that is almost the, the, the enforcement point. The idea of zero trust is, I guess, to have a design model that allows us to build that telemetry from the beginning. So your, uh, we talked about SASE earlier. We want to bring some of the security services like secure web gateways, secure browsers, um, limitations on privileged access as close to the user experience as we can, which is a component of it. So there's still design patterns that we need to consider when we build enterprise services that are separate from the ability to take action once an event is found. So I would just say that, I mean, XDR for the most part is just a, a pillar of zero trust, right? It's more of the monitoring pillar um, for the most part and the application pillar for the mo uh, most part. It doesn't have, it's not the rest of it. It's only a piece of it. So I, I also think that XDR is helping in the zero trust model because the whole point of zero trust is to decentralize your security model. That's right. And XDR is taking, you know, it's not taking the traditional perimeter approach. So you have to watch everything all the time, which is what XDR is doing. You, you fundamentally won't have the telemetry to power these decisions unless you bake in design choices ahead of time. But do you know they use endpoint protection? Yeah, so EDR is a great example. Um, so I, you know, whether you're taking the Sentinel ones, CrowdStrikes, or Apollos, the idea is you'll you'll deploy you know a sensor on your laptops, or you'll do cloud workload protection and shove it as a like a Kubernetes sidecar to get te telemetry from your containers. So yeah, these that's a great example. Like EDR endpoint detection response generates that telemetry to power uh, a broader XDR decision. Um, Okay, thank you. Yeah, I felt I don't know if I was play, I, if you were playing chump the, like stump the chump or if you're leading us. Well, I just want to know uh, we are in process of going to XDR. Just want to know if really zero trust, same thing or uh... no. Yeah, no, yeah, like I said, you have to have the other aspects. You have to have the secure web gateways. You have to have the SASE, the CASB solutions. You have to have the identity management solutions. None of those fall under the XDR. The XDR with the EDR and the NDR is getting the telemetry and doing the response and doing the monitoring. Just piece um, of the puzzle. Yeah, just, yeah. just one Your second. Your overall zero trust extended ecosystem. So what's next? Yeah. People want to eat, I guess. Yeah, they're like, I'm hungry. <laughs> Lunch is next. All right. Well, thank you guys. Oh, we've got Mike Greco is going to come back up. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the panel, panelists, for being here and really appreciate your time today. And thanks for all your expertise. Thank you guys for participating in that. I'll turn over to Michael Greco. Thanks, guys. That was great. Thank you, Dave, David, Sean. Will, and thank you for your for your time today. Hope you've found this insightful. Um, the one thing that we have learned, having done a few of these sessions, is that it uh, you develop an appetite. So we want to invite you to join us for lunch out there um, and some more networking and discussions. Uh, you know, happy to entertain more discussions uh, at one o'clock we are going to be running the security challenge. So if you haven't signed up, is that next door, Andrew? Right next door. If you haven't signed up and are interested, we'd more than uh, be happy.
we join. We have done these all over the world, Italy, London, Japan, Singapore, India, and they're a huge success and, uh, and a great way to rethink about how you handle security operations. So if you're interested, we'd love to have you join us. So with that, we will close our session for today, invite you to join us for lunch. And uh, anything else I'm missing, Andrea? No. So thank you very much.